So I think we're going to start um, uh, not so late, not as typically late, because there's a very nice uh, uh, atmosphere in the room. Um, and the this very nice feeling is, is coming from the, from, the, from the guest speakers, but, but also from, from Paul, from Paul Bayard, and the reason that we, we uh, uh, gathered together to, to have this uh, lecture with the kind of more or less perfect uh, title of Look, uh, Memory, uh, and invention, uh, and immediately you say that, we, we, you start to wonder if those two words could ever be uh, separated uh, so simply, and it, I, I'm sure this is the, exactly the purpose of the lecture, so I'm very uh, uh, excited. It is the Paul Byard Memorial Lecture, and, and uh, so it's an evening of, uh, of real pleasure and real celebration. Um, and, and it's to celebrate the wisdom and charm of, of our dear colleague, uh, Paul Bayard, who I think is just perfectly still a member of this uh, faculty, still still teaching, and was uh, officially, uh, until a few years ago, the director of our historical uh, our preservation program, and in some ways uh, still is. Uh, and in some way the, the program, which is so beautiful in this moment, is, is that way uh, as an homage to, to Paul, who was, of course, an ex extraordinarily eloquent, uh, passionate, and cultivated uh, voice, and anybody within 50 meters of Paul Bayard was instantly a victim of his eloquence, uh, and you were probably better off not to be in the room with him because whatever it was that he was saying, you would agree or be obliged to agree, uh, and even if you were going against something you had thought you believed for a very long time, he had a way of making you see that perhaps things could be thought differently. He was one of those people that coaxes others that has a way of just slightly nudging people, but if you nudge somebody 50 times, they're actually now 180 degrees around from where they started, always feeling very uh, uh, good about it. Uh, Paul was relentless uh, in his call for us to understand that preservation is a progressive art form, maybe the most progressive of art forms, that uh, preservation is an intellectual uh, challenge, that it is an intellectual activity, uh, and perhaps more than anything else, uh, uh, that it's a design challenge. And of course, for most of us, uh, that something is a progressive art form and is an intellectual pursuit is exactly what design is, a design challenge of the highest order. And Paul made, reminded us endlessly that preservation is first and foremost an adventurous act, that it's an act of uh, 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 adventure, that preservation is not the art of the mortician uh, uh, keeping something uh, back and keeping something distant but, but uh, uh, a real adventure, and that quite simply saving old buildings is absolutely crucial to the public good, that there might even not even be a concept of public good without the shared buildings that, as it were, mark uh, uh, the memory uh, 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 that we think about. Uh, as again, as I say before, Paul's mission, a uh, very, very polemical mission, uh, remains absolutely central and defines the historic preservation program, and to some extent you could say defines the wider school uh, uh, Paul is deeply missed, um, and it's you know it's always very very moving to be here with uh, with Rosalie in, in in the room to to remember these things. Uh, but really, of course, the whole point is is uh, to, to to celebrate and and to cele in celebrating uh, uh, Paul, we celebrate the idea that preservation itself is itself always a form of celebrating that thing which seems to have passed, but in fact uh, uh, lives on. And you know, it's just a perfect. Uh, we had some, for some years we had the imagination that you guys just simply had to uh, speak uh, around the name of Paul on this uh, special evening. Uh, Nieto and Sabiano, architects from Madrid, but also architects from here, from this very room, uh, both trained, uh, both in Madrid and trained here uh, uh, at GSAB, uh, really beautiful designers and very, very beautiful teachers, uh, uh, both of them, independently and together. Uh, their work, and this will be so uh, uh, obvious that it becomes almost a manifesto, stages uh, um, what could be thought of as a dialogue between the old and the new, but dialogue is not an adequate word for this. Uh, and this exchange, uh, uh, this uh, dance between the old and the new is exactly the dance that Paul always cherished and always, uh, in fact, called for. In a sense, the new loving the old and the old empowering the new and actually it not being possible to think what is the new without this celebration of the old. So actually newness and progressive thought itself and contemporary work being dependent on the particular way in which you could show love 
uh, uh, for the past. And not by accident, I think, so many of the beautiful, beautiful projects of this office are, have been in recent years museums, that is to say exactly the typology of the, the, the spaces where the old is meant to be uh, uh, protected. And when you protect the space that is meant to protect, you're in a doubling uh, situation of Paul's argument. I was lucky last year to be in San Sebastian. I mean, anybody in San Sebastian is lucky. Um, uh, but the pleasure of being there with the light and the water and the food and so on is, is absolutely complemented and, and extended by the St. Almo Museum there, which is, as I'm, no doubt you will, will, will find out, and anyway you are seeing it on the wall, is a 16th century convent uh, which has now been uh, ex extended and expanded um, with perforated metal uh, kissing the stone, uh, again with, with a kind of tenderness that I think is very much the issue that we're thinking about tonight. It's also true of the Moritzburg Museum uh, in Halle. Now it's a 15th century Gothic military, so we're going back in time. Also true of the Madinat al-Zara uh, Museum. Now it's a 10th century uh, Islamic archaeological site. So notice that these guys are walking back through time and are experimenting with the possibility of, of making the same argument that, that we recognize uh, uh, from, from a great preservationist in Paul Byard and architect, again from, from, from uh, uh, a, a new generation of thinking in architecture, and a generation that in order to move forward goes further back uh, uh, in time. So it's just a real personal pleasure for me and I think also for the school, uh, also for the wider ambitions and spirit of this place to welcome you guys back to this room in which you were so long the victims of this place and you have this one chance um, to become the victimizer uh, take it. Thank you very much for the presentation. For us, it's a pleasure to be here today. Especially, it's uh, it's a big honor to be uh, here for the Paul Bayern um, lecture. And of course, it's uh, very special for us to come back to Columbia University. Uh, as you said, we have been students here a few years ago. Don't ask me how many years. <laughs> and uh, it's always a little bit of coming back home. So thank you very much for allowing us to be here. Uh, we are going to talk about um, a number of projects, uh, I think uh, eight of them. And we are going to do it, both of us, Enrique and myself. I uh, hope that if we don't use the correct words in English, you can excuse us and try to understand us. So. Thank you. I will start uh, by mentioning briefly what, uh, what are the ideas that are behind our work, uh, which is the approach to architecture that is <coughs> reflected in these two terms. This lecture has a double title, as you see, eh? look and memory and invention. Look, of course, in, in our point of view is clearly at the beginning is, is, is what precedes any action before the, any design is starting. So the way we look at uh, existing conditions, whether, whether we are talking about historical buildings or simply uh, about the memory of places we have been before, is the very beginning of a project. This is something that will be somehow uh, a light motif of the whole uh, uh, lecture. The other one, of course, is memory and invention. And memory and invention, that is a term that we have been using in other occasions, is step by step in the last years uh, becoming for us a way of explaining this balance that is not so easy to explain because I, I believe that modern architecture always had a problem with history in, in the beginning. Uh, actually, the modern movement uh, uh, didn't uh, realize or didn't take seriously this question and the, the historical buildings should simply be restored and that was done by other specialists. And of course, the modern architect uh, uh, was not uh, in a interested, one could say, in really dealing with the work of somebody else, uh, being himself the sort of uh, head designer and the author of the whole work of architecture. So I think that probably was in the very beginning of this history, and maybe that's the reason we, we don't find so many uh, uh, many uh, examples of, of interventions in historical buildings in the, say, first half of the 20th century, and we all think immediately and say La Maison de Verre by Pierre Charot or, we, or the extension of the Gothenburg uh, uh, City Hall by Aspron, but there are nevertheless exceptions. 
probably it's not only uh, till uh, the end of the war in the 1950s and 60s in Italy when we recognize with Scarpa, Albini and so many others uh, a new way of understanding the role of contemporary architecture in relation to history. And uh, I would say that since the 1980s, 90s, etc., specifically in Europe and also as I understand in the States, this has become not only a, a way of dealing with architecture, but I would say even the most important one in places, for example, like Spain. If you analyze the work of architects in Spain in the, say, last 30 years, I would say that most of the most, uh, most interesting works have been dealing one way or another, sometimes in a very direct relation, some others only uh, as a matter of understanding a, a place uh, and the memory of a place has been the real uh, strength, I would say, of, of contemporary Spanish, Spanish architecture. So this idea is the one that I think it's behind uh, everything we would like to talk about, and it's also behind something that we always have been thinking about. Uh, we, we, ne we would never understand that somebody extends, uh, say, a symphony or a novel or a, or a painting or a film, but everybody understands that any kind of building, whether whether uh, it's of historical value or not, will be and is constantly transformed in history. So that makes a quite big difference in which uh, the, the, the role of contemporary architecture is always playing uh, a special uh, part. So uh, the words we are going to see are not all of them, most of them are intervention in historical uh, projects. We like to present them uh, not necessarily in a linear way. They are not following uh, say, um, his, uh, historical, you say, chronologic, chronological order, but they are really relating uh, a lot of uh, questions that are not only visual, but are also in the way, for example, we like to refer and we, we know from that Avi Vargur was, was doing with this atlas in his library, a, a way of relating uh, projects one with another uh, in this idea uh, that also a writer like George Perec uh, explained very well, <laughs> Uh, every work is a mirror of another one. So this is partially uh, what is going to be seen here today when talking about different projects, different ways of relating uh, not only uh, to the existing situations but also to the memory uh, that we in our own experience have behind. I'd like to show this image. This image is, you probably recognize, is uh, Salvador Dalí. It's a young lady looking through a window. For us, interesting because it's this first idea of looking at, establishing a frame, this sort of frame of thought also, that is at the very beginning of a project and that relates to the exterior world, something that we do consciously or unconsciously any time we start a, a project. Something that is, in our point of view, complementary to this other frame again. In this case, the frame, of course, is a mirror, and it says, in this case, it's a grid. And this man is looking into himself, and many ideas that relate to the mirror and to the way we, we look into ourselves are also part of this idea of how contemporary and, and historical existing situations work together. Actually, the, 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 to talk about the the window, uh, we will imagine immediately that the very moment we establish a frame, we take uh, we, uh, importance, we give importance to some parts, and, and voluntarily we, we do not to other parts. Uh, whether we're talking about a landscape that we'll see in a, in, in a historical place in Spain or in a place where we are working now in India, or historical roofs of a city in Austria where we had the chance to work in two different projects, or in a castle in Germany of the 15th century, as it was said before, the way we look at immediately determines, determines the way we, we, we will follow the whole process. Sometimes it's even more than that, it's more uh, in the detail or in the way we understand what's there, which is not necessarily the, the reality. The ruins of an old Islamic town uh, in, in, in southern Spain uh, becomes a way of understanding how to deal with contemporary architecture. Uh, a, a tower of a Roman wall in the north of Spain becomes a clue of how to deal with a uh, geometric pattern. Uh, sometimes are uh, simply not historical buildings uh, talking about this uh, general idea. We're talking, for example, about industrial places that are reconverted or restored or reused 
in which existing structures became, in some cases, in some projects we did some years ago, also the sort of the origin of how to recognize the structure of the building. Sometimes it's a more personal thing. When we had to deal with a museum for uh, expressionist art in Germany, the paintings of the, of the main collection there, in this case Feininger, became in a way uh, the, the, the starting point, not necessarily exactly only the building, also what is exhibited in the building, or even a, a religious painting of the, of, the, of, the, of the 16th century, of the 15th century becomes the origin of this museum, etc., etc. So the window, which is the frame of thought, will be uh, always, in our point of view, compared or opposed or in dialogue with the mirror. We borrow these terms for, from, from George Steiner. George Steiner was talking about the window and the mirror, not in, not in architectural terms, but in this idea that the, the window represents the objective world, what we see, we perceive, and it's over there behind the, the frame. Whereas, of course, the mirror represents the uh, subjective world, everything that belongs to us. The mirror has this other uh, way of looking at it that it represents one of our key ideas in our own way of thinking and, and working, which is this idea of combinatorial thinking. This is something that relates, of course, to the mirror, relates to the images of the cinema or of paintings that we know and we see, when simply combinations of the same element in, and the variations of these elements are able to achieve or to create the complexity that we all know and that we have been uh, working with in many different situations, in historical centers in Madrid or in temporary buildings in, in some uh, complex context in the city. All of them relate in a way to this idea, again, uh, when, when we see Duchamp playing chess with himself. This idea that one single element with, with, uh, with its own variations and permutations, etc., etc., in other words, a combinatorial thinking is behind this idea of the mirror. And it's uh, one of the elements or, uh, say, uh, mechanisms or strategies that has, uh, have been used by us uh, when uh, working in uh, historical places. For us, the model is always and comes always back to the Mosque of Cordoba. The Mosque of Cordoba, painted here by Escher when he was a young uh, man in the 1930s, represents uh, better than others this idea of combinatorial thinking, one simple double arch which is repeated and repeated in many ways. All Islamic architecture that we had the chance to become familiar with in this long process in which we, we have been working during the whole Madinat al Thara project that you will see now, talks us not only about this idea rejected again by modernism, like many others, of ornament, but, but rather about this, this idea of combinatorial elements. A simple geometrical play is able to create all sorts of, of complex uh, architectural spaces uh, in a way, uh, with all these masharabias and mukarnas and elements that we all know, and that some of our projects became the, the very origin of our geometrical uh, pattern. So difference and repetition will be one of way of, of dealing with this idea of the mirror. And of course, uh, the idea uh, that every project uh, is the mirror of another one. And this is what we briefly, and sorry for this a little bit long introduction, are going to see in the projects that we'll see now that will deal with the relation to a landscape and uh, or a historical context, the, the relation to natural light, understanding that natural light is the, is the beginning of all the architectural space. The importance of material and how the expressive value of material becomes a, a consequence of the place or the, si or, the, or the building where we are acting. Of course, everything will be with the light motif of this sort of conversation with history and conversation with whatever was there before. And also in this idea of the mirror with the value of geometry and the combination of a single system uh, that can be repeated. And last but not least, you will see that in many of our projects there is another of those questions that was forgotten by modern architecture, which is the roof. In many of other buildings, the roof becomes the beginning of a project, uh, not the flat roof that was established during the whole uh, century, but rather the roofs that we see in the historical cities, in, the, in all the places we visit, uh, and that be become a new way of, of, of looking to the buildings. So we'll start now with Madinat al Thara. Mm -hmm. 
So this is the Madinat al Zara Museum, and uh, we are going to start then in the city of Cordoba, but not in the Cordoba that we know today, but in the Cordoba of the year of the uh, 10th century, mm -hmm. in the 900, where Cordoba was uh, a place uh, of a real um, a, a city that was very well known by, by uh, the arts and by medicine and poetry. At that time, uh, uh, the Islamic, uh, the Arabs were uh, in the south of Spain, and they had been there for more or less 300 years. And there was a very important king, Abderrahman III, which at this time in the year uh, 940, named himself the first caliph of the Caliphate of Cordoba. In order to demonstrate his power, he decided to build a new city, a new, pala pala a new palace city, which was the city of Medina Zahra. Medina Zahra is located at more or less six kilometers of Cordoba and is beautifully placed in the mountains. Because of the topo topographical situation, it's developed in three different terraces. The upper one, it belongs to the caliph and their family and the fa family of the dignitaries. The intermediate one, it's for the representative area, and the lower one, which is not excavated, is the rest of the city. This city um, was a very rich city and is a city of legend. Uh, there were many legends that are uh, related to it, but of course the city in itself is a legend because it was built, as I said, in the year 940 and completely destroyed in the year 1010. So it's a city that only lived for 70 years. And uh, when 200 years later, Ferdinand X came to Cordoba, uh, the city had disappeared, and nobody really knew where the city was. It only appeared again at the end of the 19th century when it was rediscovered, and in the beginning it was thought to be the old Cordoba, Roman Cordoba, but it was the city of Medina Zahra, which is now being excavated uh, for, one, for the last century, and it's, as you see it now, only excavated in about a 15% of its area. The white area that you see there and the, mount, the walls around it, you see it in the, in, the, in, the, in, the photo, in the photo there, are the walls around the city. Of course, this made the archeological site a very interesting site because it gave a very clear idea of what was happening in those uh, uh, years in the Islamic Spain. Uh, so the government of Andalusia decided uh, to create, uh, to do a competition to create a new visitor center. Uh, we decided to enter the competition, and of course we had to deal with this situation, with this beautiful city of Medina Zahra, which we uh, didn't want in no way to touch or to um, destroy any part of its landscape. Of course, we also had this other situation, because if we look to the city of Cordoba, we had this situation in which Cordoba was growing a little bit uh, uncontrollably towards the uh, archaeological site. So we decided that we did not want to contribute at all to a situation like this. We remembered a trip that we had done to another old place the, in Syria, the excavations of the city of Ebla, in which we saw the place that you see it now, with the archaeologists have left it with the boxes traced to make the excavation. So here, metaphorically, we decided to act as archaeologists instead of architects. We took the land in which we were going to build, we traced our grid, and we were going um, to excavate on that grid, and we were going to find the new building the new visitor center for Medina Zahra. What I'm saying is that we did a buried building. A buried building that, of course, was going to relate to the landscape and to the archaeological site only with one facade, the roof. As, uh, uh, also, we uh, used the archaeological, the metaphorical archaeological grid to organize the landscape and the gardens around the building. Of course, uh, having a buried building, uh, it's an introverted building that is illuminated, illuminated, that is illuminated by patios, and that establishes one of the first links uh, to the city of Medina Zahra. In this case, not to the buildings of Medina, but to all Islamic architecture, which is introverted, 
and illuminated by uh, inside patios. The situation of the building was, of course, very difficult because we, we uh, this, I mean, the government of Andalusia was looking for a place where there were no rests at all of the old city of Medina. So it was very near the border of the wall, but outside the wall itself. The wall of the city is the one that you are seeing now. And you see uh, the city of Medina was built and is a double square, which is the same geometry that we used for the building, for the uh, new visitor center building. And this is one of uh, a series of relations that we are going to establish always with the city and its buildings. Of course, this is the floor plan in a, floor, in a building that is buried. All the light comes from interior patios. In this case, there are six of them. The most important one maybe is the uh, square in the center of it, which divides the building in two areas, a more public area uh, with the museum and a small uh, auditorium and the cafeteria and a more private area for the offices and the uh, places, the working places of the archaeologists that came from Medina with the pieces that came from Medina Zara. When you come from the old city towards the building, this is what you see. You really see uh, this situation in the landscape where the building only is um, comes out of the floor, out of the ground, for 50 centimeters, except in one single place where there is a, a, a higher um, volume from which you can look to the city of Medina after uh, visiting the visitor center. The, all the, all the, the plants that we have used uh, for these uh, gardens around the building are the same uh, plants that were used in the city of Medina and of course in the area in which we are building. The way of entering the building from the road is through these long white uh, paths that are traced over that uh, archaeological grid that was the concept for the building. They lead us to an open space through which we go down in a ramp towards the entrance of the building and we find this big corten, uh, corten door that leads us uh, to the vestibule that is, um, has, takes the light from the central patio. You see now here in the treatment of materials that we have, to be, uh, we have tried to be very strict and we are using mainly two materials. The white concrete for the slabs and the walls uh, and the corten steel uh, for the carpentry. Uh, in the courtyard, even, even being a buried building, and because of its dimension, the courtyard establishes a relation with the landscape around it. And also in the courtyard, we're trying to work also with the more, more perceptive um, feelings of architecture, like the smell of the orange trees that were there, or the water, and also the, the noise of the water and the smell of humidity of uh, the pond that we created in the garden. The other courtyards are uh, with this geometry that is thin, uh, narrow, and long. And we do this to be able to open long windows for the introduction of light, but protecting them from the very bright sun of Cordoba. This same geometry, narrow and long, it's taken into the interior of the building, in which being a buried building, all of its spaces have natural light. In some cases, because they end up in a, in a patio, in others, because they are, uh, the natural light comes in through skylights that run parallel to the principal structure of the building. In the service areas, I mean in the office areas, we use the third material, the wood that comes from the same form that we have used in the for pouring the concrete. Um, in the um, space of the museum is a double height space that is uh, linked by a ramp. Uh, at the end of the ramp, we find these stairs that lead us to that high point, high volume, the highest volume of the building that we saw in the beginning, and that uh, gets us to a window through which we can see the archaeological site that we are going to visit immediately after uh, having visited the building. 
In this building, we had the luck to also be able to work in the um, museographical project. Um, in this case, we decided to use for it the same materials that we had been using for the building, like Corten steel. The project was, the museological project, was divided in five different themes. So we decided to start each one of these themes with a Corten cube like this one, in which we are going to situate the best pieces of the theme that we are going to see afterwards. The rest of the pieces were shown in tables or direct, directly over the walls, like this beautiful piece that it's a, a path, it's a, um, a restored, I mean, it's a piece of uh, one of the roads that lead to the city of Medina Zahara. I think it's one of the most beautiful pieces of the collection. Uh, and this photograph has always been important for us because I think it's one of the important moments of an architect. When you go to see one day that you go to the site supervision and you start walking around and suddenly you are start seeing the building that you thought of and coming out with the concept that you are trying to imply. Like this, we were looking at the building and we are seeing how it came out of the ground, already finished because of the use of concrete, in the same way that the archaeologists run around the city of Medina Zahara and the city of Abderrahman comes out while they are excavating it. This is one of the a series of relations that we try to establish between the two um, situations, the archaeological site and the new building. Of course, many of these relations are personal. Uh, some of them are, for us, clear, like the way that we use the material. The city of Medina Zahara was built in one single material, the stone. And for the new visitor center, we also used one single material, the concrete. And of course, the color. The city uh, was built in stone, but it was covered with stucco of two colors, red and white. Red and white are the two colors that we have also used for the contemporary building. Uh, the co white concrete for the white color and the Corten steel for the red color. The Corten steel used in big and long plates is the one that we are going to use for covering the roof of the new building. The roof is covered following the lines of the principal structure. The use of Corten steel uh, blends, the color of the Corten steel blends with the surrounding landscape. So in a way, the building, when looked at it from the city of Medina, disappeared in the landscape. And from this building, and uh, in an archaeological uh, landscape, we are going to go to another museum, a park museum or a museum park that was built for the city of Lugo in the north of Spain. The city of Lugo uh, has grown a lot, but uh, has now uh, uh, has had has a very um, beautiful old Roman center, which is the area in orange that you see there, especially because it has a very impressive Roman wall. The mayor of Lugo decided to launch a competition for the creation of a visitor center in the spot there in the entrance of the city. So when the visitors came to visit the center of the city there, they could leave the cars and understand the history of the city of Lugo in the visitor center before visiting the city. So uh, we had uh, to these situations this, uh, that we had to build a museum for this city center with these impressive Roman walls, but we also couldn't forget that we are going to build in a nearby situation in the uh, outside in the border of the city in an old industrial area. So for us, it was important to recognize the very beautiful walls, but also not to forget that we were dealing with an area that had been related to the industry. So what we decided to do, as in other projects, we always try to give a little bit more maybe of what we are being asked for. So here we try to introduce another concept and we built 
a museum park or a park museum, a park that was going to be organized around the repetition of the same element, a series of cylinders around which the park was going to be organized and the museum was going to be in those cylinders, some of them void, some of them full. Here in the model, maybe you understand better what we, the model, the lands that we were working in had, was very steep. So we used this difference of, uh, this topographical difference to keep the cars in the road and put them at the level of the road and in the lower part and keep the museum in the upper part of the area and is the one that you see uh, around the cylinders. During the night, this, uh, the museum is transformed and uh, the own building is the one that is given light uh, to the park and is completely transformed like an, uh, an art installation in the city. The section of the building, uh, really it was, uh, the museum had one small collection, but also this, the mayor wanted to have an interactive museum. So we were asked to build a black box in which we could tell the, the, the story, the history of the city of Lugo in the big black box in the center, and in the upper part we had the physical pieces of the collection. The floor plan is, as you see, is done around the repetition and variation of the same element. Uh, full and void cylinder. Of this, we, uh, we like to work a lot with models because uh, we think that the model with the model, we try to test, to ta to test uh, the, not only the scale, but also the materials and the atmosphere that we are going to generate with the building. In this case, uh, as the build, this is the, already the built building and as you see, appear as similar to the way that it was built in the model. It's, as I said before, it's done, it's a park that is organized around the, this, the repetition of this uh, same element, the cylinder. The materials that we are using here really are the green and again the Corten steel. The Corten steel used in a way that when the light hits it in a specific way, it gets transparent so that we can see and perceive the uh, structure from the inside and the way that it has been built. Uh, as I said before, it is formed by also by void cylinders. There are these patios that we used to enter in the building not, uh, and also to introduce the light of in the building. The way the space in the inside is generated around this series of patios and also by the relation and transparency that is generated between them. The big black box in the center of the building in which we enter in the same way as through the building that is conceived like a space within a space. It's a cylinder with another big cylinder hanging on top in which the library of the building is held and again, another cylinder again as a repetition that will introduce the natural light to the library. The light is a very important issue for us, both natural and artificial, especially in a case like this in which the building during the night gets transformed and is really the building that the one that is given light and illuminating the, uh, the, path, I mean, sorry, the park around it. Uh, the buildings really get transformed at night because this transparency that I was speaking before uh, gets real with the light at night and we can perceive the structure that was built the building and the relation to the old industrial area that was there. I will continue now with another project. Uh, this other project is in this case, directly related to historical buildings. In this case, as uh, opposite to the last one, uh, we are really dealing with the extension of uh, buildings of, of historical value. We are in the city of Graz in Austria. And uh, the city of Graz, that maybe some of you know, uh, it's uh, protected by UNESCO. It's a World Heritage City. This is a situation in which we, ha we had to work in several occasions that uh, 
made us uh, aware of this uh, also difficult situation of uh, trying to convince and convincing the uh, officials of UNESCO in some cases of how contemporary architecture can deal and exist uh, together with the historical places. In the city of Graz, uh, we won this competition for the extension of the Joanneum Museum, which is not only a museum, actually is what you see on top, uh, a nature history museum of the 18th century, uh, an art museum that you see in the old Beaux Arts building of the end of the 19th, and also the library of the, of the land of Styria. Actually, Joanneum is the second most uh, important uh, museum institution in Austria, uh, be, be, besides the, the museums of, of Vienna. And uh, this, the question uh, that we were confronted with uh, is a very, in a way, in the last years common in many places. It is uh, this situation in which three buildings, the ones that you see and I mentioned before, have different entrances, uh, are giving its back one to the other, and the new project needs to uh, tie them together to organize a new entrance, new spaces, uh, visitor center, uh, cafeteria, uh, lecture room, etc., uh, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So for us, again, and like uh, it was said by Fonsanda before, the question was, is not only to answer to a series of functional questions that we are asked in the competitions. I have to say that what you, you are seeing, and 90% of our work is coming from competitions. And in this case, we propose uh, to uh, uh, use this up to now less leftover space as a new plaza, as a new square for, for the city of Graz as, a, uh, Graz, as a new public square. So actually, we were proposing to walk below Earth. By now, you will think that we only walk below Earth. <laughs> and you will see that we do it very often for many reasons, but not always. Eh? And in this case, we are working exactly in the level of the surface of the land, of the, of the ground. This is something that we like very much when we work in historical cities. You really have a very different perception. We like the roofs, as you will see, and we like the floors and the grounds, because you perceive them from very different situations. And here we are dealing with the surface, with this idea that the surface can be depth, not only physically, also conceptually. So what we propose is simply to do a series of intersections, a series of conical intersections. Imagine a huge single cone that is cut in slices, and these slices or these partial cones are creating a series of patios. Again, pure combinatorial thinking. Again, this idea that one single story can be repeated in many ways. And these elements allow us, again, to bring the light inside uh, in a different way from the projects that you saw before in Cordoba and in, and in Lugo, because also the light condition is so different in, in this part. You see the extension in the drawing in the middle of the two historical buildings. So if you look the plan below Earth, and in a not very different way from the one of Madinat Alzara that you saw before, there are the voids, the ones that organize the space. And in this case, the sequence of spaces that sometimes are interlocking, sometimes are separated, sometimes are bigger, sometimes are smaller, sometimes go deep into the second round, and, and that help to organize an otherwise simple uh, program that has a new entrance, and, and you see the lecture room, the toilets, etc., and connects to the three buildings that we also uh, are refurbishing. So uh, if you see the construction of the building, it's an interesting thing for us because it's the opposite to the construction. Yeah? It's a great effort to make it, at the end, invisible, which is another quite interesting idea that is in, in many cases when we are dealing with historical building behind us. So we are simply creating a series of holes of perforations. But again, in this idea of, of, of dealing with uh, this combinatorial thinking, what we think uh, is that uh, we are dealing also with a very, say, uh, conceptual economy, and not only talking about uh, money, also about designing and uh, concentrating and looking only to one part and developing it with a lot of detail. And once that, that is done, the whole project is done, because all the elements uh, are simply variations of the same one. In this case, for example, this this cone with all these special glasses that are rounded, uh, rounded and are, are, have different inclinations, etc. but at the end have always the same architectural detail. So that, again, this idea of the variations of one single element uh, becomes, uh, like in Lugo before, like in Marina Talzada, like, uh, like here, uh, the instrument, the mechanism 
that allow us allows us to, 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 to deal with complex situations because at the end uh, dealing with historical buildings is always uh, a difficult uh, uh, situation. What you see here is the end chance that allows you to go in and here the issue of the light becomes also different yeah? because of, of course in Austria the light is not like in the south of Spain so uh, they were very worried, the clients, uh, uh, about whether there will be enough light or, or not. And I think the decision of the cones uh, was uh, intentionally done uh, for that reason. Because at the end, it's not only an issue of bringing the light and creating a sequence of, say, uh, variable uh, translucent spaces. It is also an idea of how the existing historical buildings, sometimes unexpectedly, as you see there, reflect in the glass. So that you are below Earth, it's true, but uh, the existing historical buildings are uh, creating, are present in a way in the inside uh, of the building. The whole project is simply the sequence of uh, translucent spaces. Sometimes they go down, they, they allow to, to bring light to the different areas. And in, in this image that I mentioned before, express also that the historical buildings can be present below Earth simply by reflection, like in a periscope of, of, of a submarine or something like that. The building, and this is the most important part, uh, creates a public space that was not asked in the competition. And this public space uh, bec becomes a new plaza in the city of Graz uh, that uh, gathers all the different buildings that up to now were uh, giving its back one to the other. So this idea, um, you will see that is linked to uh, an opposite situation that we constantly have to work with. And we like the extremes. Yeah? If we work below Earth in the same city of Graz and with some, some months of difference only, we want another competition. This other competition uh, is for the Kasten and Döller, which is a, a historical um, uh, warehouse of the uh, end of the 19th century. So uh, this sort of family, family business that have been run by the family team. And every, every generation has done his, it's his own architectural uh, intervention, so to say. Yeah? So the, the, now the, the, the people running that organize a competition very close, as you see, to the, to the place where we are working in the Ioanneum, in the place uh, over there, which is in the very core of the reason why Graz is a, a world heritage city, which is the roofs. Actually, this idea of the roofs that started for us, probably in the project of Madinat Alzara, with this simply fifth facade, became uh, very clear when we were dealing with the city of Graz. Uh, when you have a, a, a mountain, when you have the Schlossberg, which is called, and you see the city from above, like in this romantic painting of the 19th century, you see this beauty of the roofs. When you see the image below, you recognize the city, you recognize probably that behind the, the river, the river Moor, you see that this is not protected by UNESCO. There you recognize maybe the building by Peter Cook over there, the Kunsthaus in Graz. But in this area, uh, the, whole, uh, the whole complex is, is protected. So in, in principle, there is not allowed to do new buildings or new architectural interventions. If you look carefully, you see that everything is not so nice. So exactly in the part where, we, where this competition was organized, there was these extensions of the 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, full of uh, mechanical elements, uh, where, uh, sh um, storage spaces, uh, air conditioning elements, etc. So the competition uh, asked for a new roof, simply, so for a part of a building again. Yeah? And uh, uh, in, if we look to the different uh, buildings that uh, uh, organize the complex, you see a Jugendstil building, the big one in the center, a 17th century building, but with a lot of additions. Again, the story that the buildings are always transformed, are always transformed in many ways. So our approach was uh, reading the structure of the roofs of this part of the city and proposing one single roof that is uh, generated again by a single element, which is the one that is repeated and in a combinatorial way transformed in different ways. In other words, one single skylight. This single skylight, which is opening basically to the north, but sometimes to the south, sometimes it's thinner, uh, shorter, longer, higher, or, or, or lower, uh, creates a system. And this is something that proved to be quite uh, useful during the whole process that we had with UNESCO, which was quite a difficult one, I have to say, because it was not based on a single form, 
uh, it was based on a system. A system of skylights allows us to simply variations of the same, uh, vari uh, allow variations of the same, of the same uh, way. For these are simply many of these uh, models that uh, you can imagine we did. Some of them made of cardboard, some of them with model makers, some of them more detailed are the ones of, of the competition that you see here. Some of them really working in the office in big scale models to test all these possibilities of uh, allowing this sort of new roof, contemporary, uh, contemporary roof that uh, gets uh, somehow uh, together with the existing structure. Some others even of chocolate because we are in, we are in Graz. And that was a very interesting uh, thing uh, of, the, of the client that mm, was aware of the difficulty of convincing UNESCO of a building like that. So they decided to really uh, produce 2,000 of these chocolate uh, boxes. <laughs> and, and, and everybody that goes uh, went there got one. So it became very popular and it was the first time we ate <laughs> our own building. So it's, it's not really a joke because it was part of a very long process. Even if you look at a section like that, I have to say that uh, we, are not, we are designing only the roof and the spaces below the roof, but not what is below. Below is simply a, a commercial building that is done by other architects, etc. But if you look to the drawings, you see some thin lines, yellow, blue, uh, I don't know if you see it. Those were many of these intermediate stages and meetings with UNESCO and with ECOMOS, etc., all these organisms, organism, in order to uh, uh, get to an agreement. This has to be lower, this has to be smaller, this has to be longer, etc., etc. But the project didn't suffer uh, any, anything, probably it, it, it simply improved because it was based on this idea of a system that also connects the roof to the space below and that at the end uh, creates uh, the, the, the possibility of extending with this contemporary architecture a historical part of, of the building. The, the, the project also tried to remember or to bring back the memory of a beautiful space that once was there, but it was destroyed in the 1960s, this, this uh, Jungensteel uh, vestibule of the, of the house. Uh, uh, in a way with a new project bringing the light down uh, to the rest of the simply normal commercial building, but re in a way playing with this idea of the memory of something that was there behind before. So uh, the building is being built slowly. So we started, uh, we are only doing the, the upper part as we told, uh, and the, it has become a very special place in the city because it's dealing with this idea that I mentioned before and was in the idea of the models of the competition. The level of the ground that is so beautiful in the cities of, of Central Europe is elevated to the level of the roofs. Uh, a forgotten place, a forgotten place in many senses uh, uh, and, and nowadays uh, has become a real uh, popular place in the city of Graz. What you see here is the building not finished. The building uh, will have a skin on top of that the building uh, is now stopped uh, for economical reasons for some time. If somebody speaks German, you will understand what's written there, Bronze Dach kommt. That means that uh, the bronze will come because the project is supposed to be uh, with a skin of, of bronze so that eventually, uh, and I'm sure it will happen one day because if not, UNESCO will become very angry, uh, very upset, uh, the building will finally uh, play with this idea of a, of a new skin that is really conceived as a, say, a sculptural piece, but it's really conceived as a series of elements that can be repeated. So the roof, uh, as one of these questions that has been important, that has been an instrument to deal with the history of, of or, 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 the, or the memory of certain places, <coughs> became step by step an issue for us. And something we started to really think about that, yeah? Uh, and, uh, and there was another occasion in which we were invited to do a competition and the answer that became uh, evident for us was simply to deal with the roof. We are talking about a German city. This is a, a city, a city called Halle, one hour and a half south from Berlin, 30 kilometers away from the Bauhaus in Dessau, a city. You know that the German cities were almost all, all of them destroyed in the war, but the center of Halle was not completely destroyed. The center of Halle had good luck in that sense because uh, it was very close to Leipzig. Leipzig was destroyed. And if you look carefully there, you see the, one of the very important buildings uh, of the city, which is the Schloss, the castle of Moritzburg. 
This is a castle built uh, in the f at the end of the uh, 15th century, 1485. Uh, the, the castle of the, of the Bishop of uh, Brandenburg. To, uh, so in a way you have to imagine a religious place, but it's also, a, of course, a place of power in, a, in an area uh, in which only 50 years later, uh, Martin Luther in the nearby, nearby town of uh, Eisleben was uh, starting the the, the reform. So it, uh, that made, made, made you understand that the history of the castle has been so changing in, uh, over, over history. But there was one moment that was uh, really hard for the building. That was in the war of the 30 years, in the 17th century, when the, when the Swedish destroyed two of the wings uh, of, the, of, the, of the castle. So that you look at it now in these romantic uh, uh, paintings or aquarelles, and you see always a ruin. And this was interesting for us because this ruin, the ruin as they called it in the city, uh, had never been rebuilt uh, except partially in some parts. There was only one full project before us, and that was in 1824, that was Schinkel, a not, a not very well known project of Schinkel, in which he was transforming the, the castle for the University of Halle. Halle was one of the main university cities in Germany. Uh, keeping, of course, all the base and the, the historical tower and doing this um, neo-Gothic project that finally, uh, for whatever reason, was never built. So uh, this idea of the ruin uh, was in the city. The city called the Castel di Ruine, the ruin. The, the building uh, was a museum in two of the swings, the two that were, had been restored. You can, we could see the paintings, uh, all these romantic paintings, all this romantic image of the ruin, so close to German character and history. And this is the way we found the, the place when we entered the competition. So for us, it was clear from the very beginning that we should respect this idea of the ruin. We simply didn't want to rebuild something else on on top. The other thing that became important, and I have mentioned it before, is the whole idea of the roofs, these very steep roofs of Central Europe. So strange for us, uh, being architects from Spain, from Southern Europe, but nevertheless so clearly present in the city, even in the castle, even in the center of the city. This is the Marienkirche in the center of Graz. For us, a very interesting building maybe not only because of the building, that is, by the way, a double church, <laughs> two churches that got connected behind, that's a very interesting story, but besides because it was painted by Feininger. Feininger, of course, that you know so well, and, and who, who was doing the first image of, 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 the, new, of the nearby um, um, Bauhaus, um, at yeah, the beginning of the Bauhaus, you know, he was living in Halle and he was living in this castle where he was painting all this series of paintings uh, that are so well known and are exhibited in the, in the project. So for us, this idea of the ruin, the roofs, Feininger, uh, all this expressionist art that was the key question of the, of the museum became uh, the reason of trying to understand it and simply respond with a single gesture. This single gesture is we should simply build a roof. And this roof, which is the one that you see here, is again a pure combination of, uh, of one single element, the, the, the pyramid uh, skylight, positive or negative, in other words, uh, a folded uh, uh, roof that uh, will be put on top of the ruin, keeping the ruin basically as it was, and also adding a tower in the, in the, in the one that disappeared in the, in the war of 30 years. So, in a way, again, this idea of uh, trying to uh, make a, a project that keeps the whole space in the case, this is almost 100 meters long and 18 meters wide, this is the main space, with some hanging uh, new exhibition spaces. Again, a big effort, like the one we showed before, uh, that we didn't want to show. The big effort is this one, uh, the roof. It need, needed to, to be uh, structurally uh, quite complex in order to avoid any presence of any structural element in the middle of the old castle. Uh, so this image of the, of the model expresses very well the idea, simply something that you put on top that when it's there creates this sort of conversation that we all like, we like to do the, with, with the historical roofs of the, of the museum and the abstraction of our new uh, roof that was really built and inaugurated two or three years ago 
this is an image still in construction, the building appears uh, like uh, as a simple element made of one single material, which is aluminum, a thick aluminum, very precisely built like they know how to do in Germany. And, <laughs> and with a roof that you always liked to do something like that. Of course, this is forbidden. We did it only <laughs> with our friends the one day that we came there. Uh, because, of course, the roof is a place uh, that we didn't want to be spoiled with handrails and anything. It becomes a, really an idea uh, and a concept. Uh, in any ways, that day uh, we were all very happy of playing in the new roof. Uh, it expresses also an idea that is, is always present when we deal with historical buildings. The buildings uh, that usually are done, in many cases, of stone or brick, they are deeply rooted and anchored to the ground, and not only physically, also in, uh, conceptually. And the uh, say, contemporary uh, intention of avoiding the, the, the gravity, which is something that this project tries to explain, sometimes with this roof that disappears in the usually very gray uh, uh, skies of Germany, uh, and sometimes uh, appears uh, with this sort of sculpture value like in the new tower, simply a service tower in the corner, that for us, again, is always going back and forth, in this case, to the, to the, the, the very collection that is exhibited below. And the building inside is simply this big space, this big space with the hanging uh, exhibition areas on top. And again, it's always establishing this compression or expansion of the, of the space between the contemporary modern elements and the historical ones that are respectfully restored uh, and, and kept. Well, this is uh, the idea that was behind the whole uh, process of the castle of, uh, of uh, Moritzburg, and that deals directly with the intervention in historical buildings, like the one that Fuen Santa will explain now. Um, and now we are going back to Spain, and curiously we are going to work in another building that was built in the center of Spain now, in Valladolid. And at the same year as this other one, it was uh, in the late 15th century, but the same year both of the buildings were built together. In order to, to more or less make the connection, it was also at the same time that the Catholic kings were um, financing the trip of Columbus to America. So this was... Uh, this was this other uh, museum. It was also a convent, a college for monks to study physics and metaphysics. Uh, the, this is a very special building, very protected, and it has a very special collection. This is one of the pieces of the collection. It's a collection that is a very important collection, but especially in the way that is linked to its an, uh, um, religious art collection. Uh, I'm showing this medieval painting here now because it helped us to work in the concept of the project. As you see, this is uh, one single painting, but in this single painting, it we are, uh, uh, is a painting that is speaking or talking about different stories. You see that it has a central story, but all the border of it is talking about different stories, but holding it in the same painting. This is the same thing that we did with this building, when you see it now. We recognize a very complicated building in which we recognize different situations. So we're going to, we were going to work in the same building, but acting and uh, answering back to the building in, with a dialogue in different intensities. We are going to work with a, a low, medium, and high intensity, depending on the uh, physical necessities of the building. We are talking about a building, late 15th century. Uh, this is a, a historical photograph, maybe you don't see it very well, but it's a very important facade. It's a late Gothic facade, worked in stone, and is uh, one of the most important facades of this style in Spain. It also had, has a very important uh, cloister a very important and very strange cloister because of the columns and the very long columns that it had in when touching the ground. Of course, this, um, as I said before, it was a convent and a college, a college in which the monks studied physics and metaphysics. 
uh, in the 17th and 18th century, it became rather forgotten. And then it, uh, uh, was, it didn't belong to the church anymore, so it had uh, different uses. It became office use, it became, there were horses inside, and there were, it was really very badly treated until finally, in 1935, it was recovered and restored for, uh, for National Museum of Sculpture. And it has not been restored since 1935 until now, when we also entered the competition for the restoration and, uh, and enlargement of the building. Uh, here is the situation of the building. As I was saying before, it's, the situation was very complex and we had to recognize different Di um, different situations in it. In the central area, the area of the cloister and around the cloister, we are going to act with a very low intensity and using practically only restoration of the building because it was, it's a, a very, um, the building is quite well preserved and is very important uh, building there. On the added part on this side, um, it was an addition that the building got 50 years after its first construction. And it got uh, completely, um, the fire knocked the building down. So uh, the only thing that was kept was the facade that was built of stone. What we did there, we acted with a medium intensity and we recovered the original volume of the building that had up to five stories. And there was another area which has like a sad story, which was the, uh, the aula of metaphysics that was completely destroyed and disappeared, and that when we entered in the building, we found that on top of it, uh, the restrooms of the building had been built. So we decided to knock them down and start again, and in that, uh, we are going to act with a high intensity, and we are going to build a new area for the visitors that came to the building. This is the cloister, and this is the part of the building in which we uh, acted very carefully restoring the building. As you see, as you, I said before, it's a very important cloister. It's built of two different stones, a harder stone for the columns, which we cleaned and we cleaned by hand in order not to um, break the stone. And another type of stone, the one that you see uh, down here in the photograph down there, which is a much um, softer stone, uh, and it's carved really like in a trellis. It was very difficult to clean it and to restore it, and we uh, used a, a laser technique, so we were cleaning it with laser to restore it. In the inside, the building has these very beautiful and important uh, wooden slabs, I mean, uh, roofs, ceilings of wood. So we decided also to restore them. As you see, the, these wooden roofs um, proposed already a colored horizontal, a um, colored horizontal plane. So we decided also to use a wood for the floors and keep the walls uh, in a whiter color, which is also in a way how the building was built, as you see here and in, in these other spaces, as you see the roofs, I mean the ceilings, very spectacular, but in some places where, we, where the stone was carved and the walls were done of stone also carved, and we had also this white color that, we, that was the same color that we used for the interior restored uh, walls. In some of the places that we didn't have these ceilings, we could make some new connections and communications in order to make the museum work in the circulation around it. And here we also had the possibility of work with the collection, and we used these uh, places of communications to um, put the more important pieces of the collection in, at the beginning and at the end of these new open spaces um, in order to enhance the most important pieces. In the big areas or the big spaces of the, the big rooms, we tried to work with the center of the space. So we situated the statues, or I guess you say statues, in the middle of the room um, in a way that they were like talking to each other or mm, in, in a dialogue between them. This is the area in which we were working with the restoration of the building. Then we have another area behind the um, stone facade 
in which we needed to create a bigger space because there were uh, big pieces in the collection that couldn't be located in the rooms that we already had. So we decided to reproduce the volume that the building had once, and we did it with a concrete folded beam that also, as in the case of the Morrisburg before, left a complete, uh, uh, an empty space with no columns in it. The light, of course, was coming from above, and like that, we created a bigger space in which the more important and big pieces of the collection could be shown. And uh, in the last area in which we demolish the existing, um, the existing, uh, the, the existing restrooms, we uh, created a, a new small building that was going to be used for the re for the reception of visitors. We used only two, basically two materials, um, the copper and the wood, and in the inside also all of the new space and the new room was covered with wood, and by transparency we could also see the rest of the historic building. Of course, this space uh, was used for all these um, necessities that a museum has, like a shop and restrooms and all of these things, buying the tickets that we needed to have in order to enter in the museum that we are going to see later. And from uh, this museum in the center of Spain to another convent in the north of Spain, in San Sebastián, uh, that was built a little bit later in the 16th century. And as you said before, San Sebastián, if you have not been there, it's a beautiful city. I'm not trying to promote my country, but it's really a place <laughs> that is worth going to see. And uh, this is an aerial photograph of San Sebastián that I like to show because it's very impressive to see that uh, the city has not changed in its evolution with the years. It's now, this is a photograph in which the end of the photographs is it's a mountain called Mountain or Wool that has been completely free since the creation of the city. This is the origin of the city. You see the Mount Urgul in the back and the old city at the border of the Mount, of the Mount Urgul. The city of San Sebastian was uh, destroyed completely by the French troops of the Napoleon troops and then was rebuilt again. But again, the, the mountain was kept untouched. So we have this situation here uh, with, with the new city in which we have this connection between the natural landscape and the urban landscape that is getting together in this border of the Mont Urgul. It's exactly in this border where this convent is. And in fact, it's an important building for San Sebastian because it's one of the few buildings that was not, not affected by the fire that destroyed the city. So we entered a competition for the restoration and also the enlargement of this building. And we had uh, uh, to make it much bigger. The building now had 5,000 square meters and we were supposed to build 11,000. So it was a very big uh, ampliation. The building had, had already one had, had already been touched in, uh, in the back of the building in a way that we really thought it was a little bit aggressive to the building. To the, you see one, the extension of the building and uh, the church by the side. The situation is as the one you see now there, it's the convent, which is really in a very special spot of the city because it's that place in which the mountain, the natural landscape, connects with the urban landscape. And around it, you, you have the mountain, the natural landscape, you have the sea, you have the old city and the new extension of the city. It's precisely in that very special place where we had to act. And we decided to leave the building untouched as it is and to act exactly in that border. And in that border, we are going to recreate again the relation between the natural landscape and the urban landscape. So what we really decided to do was to create two new walls, two inhabited walls that through its geometry were going to establish a new relation with the mountain and at the same time with the existing building. At the same time, we are going to provide with a new entrance that was going to be held in the building to the, uh, to the mountain, to the mountain or wool. You see here the floor plan, 
and you see that is very uh, special here you see the church and the cloister which are the original cloister and you see that the cloister is a little bit tilted and that is because it had to be adapted to the situation of the mountain so we are acting with the new building right in the back in this very long and narrow space and the the old building and the new building only touch in three specific places you see three three connections there in order to be able to provide a correct circulation in the museum and that the two buildings really worked as one. Of course, very important was the way that we are going to treat this new facade, because this new facade, that we really thought of it as belonging more to the landscape than to the urban um, area, was the one through which the two buildings were going to relate. For that, we asked, uh, we worked with a, with a very young, uh, with a couple of young sculptures of San Sebastian, Leopoldo Ferran, and Agustina Otero. With them, we did take walks around the mountain, and we saw this landscape in which we perceived these holes in the rocks that were done by the erosion and the sea. And through these holes, sometimes we saw the, that some green was growing out. So we decided to translate that same idea to our building. And what we did was we worked with uh, panels, with cast aluminum panels, and with perforations, diagonal perforations, in the same way as the erosion has done with the rocks. And through them, with the time, we would have this greenery coming out of these perforations as in the mountain. Uh, so what we did really was uh, making a whole facade with the variation and the combination of five different panels. The panels went from one blank panel to a very perforated panel of 260 uh, holes, different holes. By the combination of these different panels, we built, it, we built the whole facade. Of course, in the distance, we see the volume of the building. And the volume of the building relates again to the mountain, not only to the mountain, but to the uh, constructions that were already in the mountain and to the existing convent. But when we get nearer, we start understanding the, the facade and the depth of the facade, because it's a facade that is studied by layers. Of course, this facade prolongs itself in the ins to the inside of the building, creating these new spaces in dialogue with the spaces of the old building. When I say that the facade is done by layers, it's the facade during the night also is uh, the lighting of the building. And we have these different layers. That, that one, the first one, the introduction of the natural light in the inside of the building when we need it. Uh, the second layer is the artificial light. In this case, is the light that is going out of through the facade and that is giving the light and the illumination of the building. And then the opaque area in which the plants are going to grow and are going to relate that facade to the mountain wool and are going to keep it in a constant change. I uh, like to put this photograph in order to understand the specific situation of the building. As you see, we are working really in the border in a very extreme situation between the mountain and the existing convent. This very uh, situation, this very narrow and long situation is translated to the inside of the building in which we are also working with concrete, in this case, uh, white concrete, but with um, darker stone in order to get like a golden color of the concrete that relates uh, to the stone in which the old convent was built. The light of, uh, in the building is, uh, comes from these very uh, horizon long horizontal cuts that you have seen, and also from these vertical uh, cuts that uh, bring the light from the roof of the building, and the light is coming down, relating all the spaces of the inside of the building. Um, the building, both of them, are always the old convent and the new one are always in relation with the city. And again, we are going to start, to start with this series of relations that again, I'm going to say that uh, most of them, they can be personal of contemporary architecture and the historic architecture in the sense that we, the way that we treat it and the way that is mm, the ambience of uh, 
the, the two situations, the two related spaces. And here, for example, with the continuity of the stair in which we directly built another stair on top in order to communicate with the new level that we installed under the roof. Of course, the contemporary architecture in relation with the historic one, always the new facade and the old facade in a dialogue together, and the new facade coming out uh, to the plaza, to the new relation between the, mount, the uh, urban uh, area and the new natural area, and really creating a new installation for the city. Well, I will end the lecture with the last of the projects that we are showing uh, today, uh, which is uh, a new building. It's not really an extension of an existing building, uh, but in a way, and that's uh, important for us to transmit, uh, uh, it represents very well that it's not only about uh, extending existing buildings that we are interested in or where we are working in these ideas, that in any case, even a new building can and should be, in our point of view, uh, deeply related to the memory of a place and to the way we interpret this idea. So in this balance that we try always to talk about, about this memory and invention. And like in a circular story, go back to the beginning. Yeah? This is, again, the city of Córdoba, the place where we were working before during 10 years, that was a long period of time for us, it was Madinat Alfara. The place where we have just finished our last building is in the very center of Córdoba, uh, just in front of the, of the old city. Uh, actually, in front of the building I mentioned before that for us represents uh, one of the key elements of, uh, I would say, Spanish architecture, but I would say uh, architecture uh, of the history that is so powerfully related to the uh, contemporary thinking, uh, which is the Mosque of Córdoba. Actually, it's in, uh, in the other side of the river, in the place that you see there in yellow, in front of a very long building that maybe some of you recognize, this sort of ghost of Rem Kulhas, because he won uh, this competition some years before for a new uh, big uh, congress center in Cordoba. Uh, it's a story that maybe some of you know. He won this competition when all the other uh, invited architects had to do it in the yellow square. Uh, all of them did it in the yellow square, except Ron Colhas, who did it there, and he won. That was uh, very good for him, <laughs> uh, but definitely for us, because uh, two years later, there was a second competition in the yellow square. Again, <laughs> again a series of architects invited, and we won it. And we started before, and so we have built it. Uh, but uh, the crisis made that the Ram has built it never started. So who knows? But now with the big crisis, this is the situation. But besides this story, uh, for us it was very interesting uh, for, uh, to be involved in front of this building we always had been so interested in. The building of the Mosque of Córdoba that I mentioned before uh, that I strongly recommend, as for instance, I recommended to go to San Sebastián, to go to Córdoba and to visit it, not just for the historical value and meaning that, of course, it is a building that was built in the 8th century. It was a building that was extended many times. In its very core of the, I mean, of the system of this famous double arch that is repeated, repeated infinitely, uh, you have a system that admits extension. This is a very contemporary way of thinking. It is also pure combinatorial working and thinking. You design simply one double arch and that's it. Then you have all the complexity that you have there. It's a building that admits the extension by means of other architects in the future, like the Christians did when they put the cathedral in the middle of the, of the building, etc., etc. So uh, we were confronted with that and also with this idea that uh, working uh, during 10 years uh, uh, in, the, in the project of, of Madinat Alfara, and also the project got the Aga Khan Award, and it was very much related to something that for us has become important now, which is 
the, the relation of contemporary architecture also with the Islamic uh, architecture, which is so rich uh, in, uh, for example, in Spain, in southern Spain. And I mean by that all this issue of the ornament, another of those uh, elements forgotten by architecture, uh, by contemporary, uh, sort of modern architecture, uh, and nevertheless for us important, not so much because of the ornament, uh, but really because of the real possibilities of working with these patterns that uh, you see there, so that in a way we were asking ourselves when we entered the competition, are we able to really transform these Masharabias or these Mukarnas into an architectural space to blow up, to, to zoom this scheme and, and make a, a different way, a sort of an invention of an architecture based on the memory of the Arabic uh, times. So uh, this was at the beginning of the project uh, of, the, of the Contemporary Art Center, so a sequence of spaces uh, that will create a porous building, a building that can be crossed from one part to the other, that is not hierarchical in the way it's conceived, that can be used in many different ways. I have to say that it's a contemporary art center that means that it has not a collection, it's simply a place where the artists will work and eventually show their work, uh, an open place uh, linked to, uh, say, uh, new technologies in art, if we can say that, you know, digital art, net art, video art, etc. Uh, so the project starts with a simple geometrical play, the, the ones that we learn from the Islamic uh, patterns. You know, an hexagon, a, a rectangular, uh, sorry, a, 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 a regular hexagon that we divide in three rooms. One room of 150 meters, one of 90 meters, one of 60 meters. If we start to play with symmetries, rotations, etc., etc., we find a whole system of rules that are so simple, because they are really simple, we don't need to look to, to very complex uh, uh, digital, digital uh, programs in order to play with that. Actually, we only use them after uh, words, after playing with the very simple ideas, so that a sequence of uh, one, two, three, four, and a fifth uh, uh, hexagon, which is uh, blow up for the, for the big uh, space of the black box, create a system of variations, spaces that can be used as a one single space or as a system of small uh, separate exhibition spaces. So as I mentioned before, we started with the hands and with the hands making this, in, uh, trying to imagine this sort of systems that eventually became bigger mm -hmm. models and more elaborated models. And that led us to this project that uh, is really conceived in a very basic uh, program on the left side, the studios for the artist. In the center area, the whole system of polygonal spaces for exhibition. On the right, a sort of interior uh, souk or interior street that allows you to, uh, 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 to use the buildings in, in the building in many different ways. Besides, of course, cafeteria, a media tech, etc., etc. A building that you can cross and enter from two parts of the, of the city. More important for us in the section, the section and the roof, as I mentioned before, is in the beginning of many projects. The section is a sort of ex ex exploded or, or, or blow up um, mukarna or detail that you see in the Arab, uh, uh, in, in, La, in La Alhambra and in so many places. In other words, it becomes an inverted dome or an inverted uh, skylight uh, that is connected in many different ways. It's a space that is also built in one single material. It's a, since it's going to be a, an art center, and when, when talking to French artists, they always said, well, we don't like a new building. Actually, what we like is an old industrial building or something like that. But in this case, uh, they, were, they, want, they, were, they were going to have a new building. So uh, we wanted to, to transmit this idea for sort of a factory uh, with rough concrete inside that can be perforated in many holes, as you see, and therefore used in many different ways. So uh, the models that we were building were talking about this idea of this inverted uh, skylights that create the system of the roof, as I mentioned before, always thinking back and forth in the uh, buildings of old Cordoba, and, not, uh, and by extension, I would say, from old uh, Arab uh, times in, in, in Spain. So the, process, the process became with the hands, from the hands went into the computers, from the computers and models and more elaborated models, and in the process became built, which is so important because for us 
uh, the form, uh, uh, architectural form uh, uh, is supported in construction. And this is something we try to explain when looking to most of the buildings we sell, whether we are talking about a uh, building below earth, which is uh, an analogy or a metaphor of a of an archaeological site, like the one at the beginning, or whether we are talking about the limit between natural and artificial in San Sebastián, or here simply uh, about the system that uh, uh, becomes construction itself, even if in the distance looks uh, uh, ornament. So the building is in front of a river. These were the first models of the competition. Uh, after that, winning the competition, we decided to explore this idea of the facade that is seen from the other side of the river. In this case, uh, in this case we invited some, uh, a group of Berlin, uh, Realities United, that had been working in media facades, for example, in the, in the Kunsthaus in Graz, in some other cases. And together with them, we developed a facade that becomes something special again, because the building is going to be uh, with uh, white concrete GRC panels outside, and the idea is that you never recognize that this is uh, a dynamic or, or media facade at all. Uh, when it's uh, not uh, turned in the night, you simply see uh, the facade of the building, which is what more or less you see here in the building already built. The building is uh, just finished and uh, not yet in use because these photographs are only about three, four weeks ago. Uh, it will take some time till it's finally in use. It expresses many of the ideas that I was trying to explain, we were trying to explain during all these different projects. And one of them definitely is the value of the roof, as you see there. Yeah? The roof that uh, in some cases in Madinat al Zara was simply uh, the, the flat expression of it. Uh, or in Moritz's work uh, became the, the origin of the whole idea of, of how to cover the ruin or, or in the park or in some others that we didn't see today. In other words, the roof as something that was forgotten by modern architecture voluntarily and nevertheless uh, for us uh, represents very much a way of uh, defining not only when in Spain we say never, never start the house by the roof, but I don't know in English if you say that also, but we start the house by the roof in many cases because roof means section, means natural light, means space. Uh, another thing uh, that you have been, and I have been mentioning several times, is about this idea of combinatorial thinking or repetition. Uh, in several of our projects that some of them we showed today, some others not, we are simply defining one single element. And this single element is able to be transformed into many others. Uh, and therefore uh, achieving this complexity that we know. Here in Cordoba we were confronted, like on the other side of the river, with the mosque that you see over there, but also with the scale of the city, the color of the city. Uh, even being a very big building, the roof breaks down the scale, or, or at least this is what we intended. The building can be seen from the other side of the river, by the way, a beautiful project by Juan Navarro Baldevec, who did all the, the riverside on the other side. Uh, this is the back side of the building uh, where the studios of the artists are placed and this, this will be a, a garden that is not yet built. Uh, the big box that you saw on the rest is, the, is the, the, the black box for media events. The entrance is a, a leftover of the simple geometrical system. This leftover allows you to get in and when you get into the building, the whole building is simply done with, again, one single material, again, concrete, something that we have used, as you see, in many buildings. And in this case, became a, a special um, task uh, in order to achieve all the, you can imagine, difficult scaffolding or forms uh, that were needed to create this whole system uh, that, in a way, tries to achieve vaguely, because it's a different thing, this idea for space that has no a hierarchy that can be connected in many ways. You can, you can see in some details that there will be these doors that uh, come down in order to separate all these different spaces. You see that the skylights are, are down there. They are small because this is a media center. Most of the things that are going to be shown here are, are, are audiovisual, so they don't need much light. No? They can be, they can be uh, make opaque in some cases. The scale of, the, of those uh, inverted uh, skylights is quite different. Sometimes it's very low, sometimes it's very high, and you can see it by the, by the, by the figure of the, 
of the human body over, over there, depending on the different sites. So again, variations of something that looks the same in plan, nevertheless in section becomes so different, but again in the roof becomes uh, unified. Uh, the different levels connect uh, again one part to the other. You see all this system of round perforations. Every 90 centimeters we have a hole and there is a space in between the walls so that it will be all the possibilities of connecting mm, uh, screens and sound or smell or bars or whatever it's needed because uh, one accepts from the very beginning that this is only a container, but it's a container that will be, it will be transformed by the artists themselves. But one important thing for us was to reject this idea of the standard neutral container, the universal container that is that in principle most of the curators like. And here we really wanted to propose something quite different, a building uh, to which the artist should and have to react, whether liking it or whether disliking it. And in any case, uh, this is probably behind uh, every, every art work or art installation. The big box is the black box that you see behind these walls. It's a much bigger room that is able to be used for many, for many type of installations or even for a lecture or events or many, uh, anything. Because in, in principle, I insist it's only a container to react uh, to, to it. Some parts of these perforations come from the exterior wall, and again, there is only one window. If you remember the window we started at the beginning, in many of our projects that we didn't show today, there is a window, the one that establishes a frame, in this case, to the other part of the river that you see from the other side, uh, and that connects to, to, the, to, the, to the other part of the city. In the interior, the studios that you saw there, are simply spaces that can be connected, as you see, with a very s simple system of industrial doors. Uh, these doors connect rooms, and these rooms uh, eventually connect to the exhibition spaces below uh, in a whole system that plays a little bit with an idea of a, of a labyrinth, if you want to tell it like that. The, the administration and the laboratories for this space are simply uh, working spaces when again natural light becomes treated in a special way. Sometimes like that, which is not so common in Andalusia, sometimes really like that, when all these perforations from the exterior uh, become present also in the geometry of the shadow uh, in, in the floor. The geometry that becomes also the roof, as I mentioned before, and that if you see the building uh, from far away with an airplane, then uh, you see that also the importance of the patios. If you follow the geometrical pattern of the spaces, it's very regular. It looks random, but it's not random at all. But the patios are random because they are simply the leftovers of these intermediate spaces. So the patios become important, become simply the space of light where you are only confronted with the, with the sky. Uh, in a way uh, that is very much or very common also to all the southern and I would say Islamic uh, buildings very much introverted uh, uh, inside. Uh, also the material, which is the last part, uh, is clearly confronting the rough interior of concrete with this exterior that plays the role of this connection with the, with the memory of the, of the Islamic patterns. Actually, this would, be, uh, this would mean, or very basically for me, mention this idea of the expressive value of the material as opposed to what in other times was the language question in architecture, etc. So uh, here in this case, remember this was uh, Madinat al Farah or the buildings we were showing today or some others. In each of them, the material becomes an expression of an idea that supported the project. Uh, so uh, that's not simply an election of what do we use here. It's always related to something that is behind. So in Madinat al Thara, remember, it was not only this idea of the ruin. For us, it was also the connection to the Andalusian agricultural. If you have been to Andalusia, all the white buildings in the, in, the, in, the, in the field. This is a building we did in Merida years ago, also a very historical city in Merida. It's a Congress center. For us, the whole scheme was a treatment that related to this sort of remote past of the city. Uh, now we are working, uh, and after this Aga Khan Award, uh, maybe by chance or not, but, but in, different, in different countries that are related also to this culture. And in this case, we are working now in, in Marrakesh, 
in the museum. We are only at the beginning, uh, but in this case, the ram earth becomes the material that clearly, and this is maybe logical to think of it, uh, expresses the idea of the, of, the, of the building we are starting only now to design. The same way we are only starting with a project in India, but this project in India and Delhi is dealing, in this case, with the power of the stone, the red stone of Delhi. And somehow we simply pretend in our project, which is only at the very beginning, to build a giant red stone. And that would be the whole idea of the project. Well, if we go back to our, our Cordoba project, what should, shall we do when we were going to do this treatment of the facade? Yeah? For us, it became simply evident. Uh, again, a pure combinatorial idea. We take the roof, we scale it down. And by scaling it down, we create this system of bowls. These bowls have different dimensions, but are all made of concrete. Only in the lateral part that you see in this test image on top, you will have these LED lamps, only white, black and white. There is no color. This is not a media facade. It's a, it's a word I don't like, but in any case, I, I, don't, I don't know how to express it, express it better. This is a test uh, done recently. The, the building is uh, not yet uh, in use, so all you see is still test. Uh, I like to see at the end also on the right side the mosque. The building is always with the mosque uh, on the other side of the river. So it will be in any case a facade that can be used by the artist, by the artist inside or by whoever with the new media that can in, in real time uh, uh, do any type of installation that will be seen uh, from the other part of the river. So if you see this treatment that is not purely ornamental and it's also technological, it's a quite interesting development with this group of Realities United in which each of these poles that at the end we have 1,500 is really a pixel, as you can imagine, and has three different scales. Some of them are very big, some intermediate, some of them small, and uh, eventually become this uh, uh, somehow magically illuminated uh, facade in the exterior, uh, uh, whereas during the day, uh, the building simply uh, does not uh, explain what's going on inside. The building has always this uh, uh, view from the other side. The mosque always in the right, always present, at least for me, for us, as a, a memory of the origin of all these ideas and many others that have influenced us. And it's in, the, in a way almost looking back to you. Uh, the building is not in use, but there was already a first installation by a group of uh, very young artists from Madrid, artists and architects, very young people, uh, Taller de Casqueria, and during construction they did this uh, short video that shows and helps to explain the relation of the human body to the, to the building.
Thank you very much. Well, I, I will say that we, will, we wouldn't re react in a very different way from the one we have seen up to now. You say that India is so different. Uh, it's different. Evidently, it's different because it's a very strong and personal culture. But for us, it will be, uh, or, or at least it is the way we are working up to now, it will be, a, again, a reaction that comes from us that, may, that means that it's, in a way, personal. Uh, towards something that exists there. And of course, the culture of India is so incredibly rich. And the area, I cannot talk very much about this project because it's still at the beginning and, and still even uh, it cannot be shown. But, uh, but I can tell you about, for example, going there and learning so much about the Mughal culture and learning so much about the differences between the extremes of the Islamic world, that means Spain or Morocco on one side and India in the other one. Uh, and, for example, in all the geometrical patterns that, for example, in the case of India and the Mughals, is about the octagon and how the octagon, as opposed to the hexagon here in Spain, creates a system uh, that is apparently similar, but it's really very different. So many of these ideas, but I mention it here, we mention it here basically because of the idea of the material. No? We were very impressed by stone. We almost never work with stone, and suddenly stone becomes for us not something that we want to use, but something that we want the project to be that, which is, uh, but I cannot tell you very much about that because maybe in one year we're going to tell you much more. So. such an exquisite way, you echo what I think uh, uh, Paul was, was more or less saying, which is no memory without invention, no invention without uh, memory. It was an uh, amazingly beautiful word. It was so great to see you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.